So when I was 15 years old, I was invited to my first party, and I was really excited. But for some reason unknown to me, me and my best friend Ian, we wanted to take helium balloons with us. Don't ask. And, but we were too cheap to afford helium. So I remember reading in some cookbook that you could make hydrogen, which did the same thing. So great. So me and my friend Ian, we went to town and we went and got some of the things that would be on your regular shopping list, like water, tinfoil, sodium hydroxide, and one other ingredient, ingredient that I won't list off because I don't want to be liable for any missing fingers after this talk. So we went back to, my, uh, back to my house, went into my back garden, and got an empty uh, plastic two-liter bottle. And we put together this deadly concoction. My friend Ian, who's the 15-year-old the scholar and scientist that he was, declared that if we shook it, the reaction would be faster. Great. So he took the bottle, and we stood over it. And uh, the solution eats away at the tinfoil, doing two things, generating heat and making hydrogen gas. So the plastic bottle became more elastic, and the gas started expanding, and all of a sudden, in three seconds, we had a bottle of this size. So I said to Ian, uh, Ian, I think we better stand, and then there was a deafening blast. Um, <laughs> and uh, sodium hydroxide, which is 14 on the pH scale, went everywhere. After about 20 seconds, I regained my sight. For the 20 seconds later, I regained my hearing. My friend Ian thought he had died because he just saw a white light and heard a faint buzz. So he then said to me, after regaining his hearing but not his sight, said, James, I can't see. So I ran and grabbed the garden hose and shoved it in his face and forced him to open his eyes, sent him to the shower. I went to the other shower and rinsed off. And then I casually walked downstairs to my mother, who had just come home, and said, Mom, what would happen if you got chemicals near your face? She said, well, I suppose you have to go to A&E. I said, oh, great. Yeah, so casually walked upstairs and said, uh, Ian, uh, let's see your face. So I decided to tell my mom we needed to go to A&E, not just when his lips or his tongue was bleeding, but his eyes. So what came out of it was after we got his eyes pumped, we walked away relatively okay. We had some light burns to the face and other areas. My friend Ian, who was quite pale naturally, had a small bit more of a tan, but I suggest you stick to fake tan, because that's a lot safer than sodium hydroxide. Coming out of it okay, the only regret that we had, and it was just killing us, but why didn't we film it for YouTube? <laughs> so, looking back, you know, I realized that life is short. And you, you do, uh, do what you love and go out with a bang, but preferably not literally. And dare to be different. People laugh at you because you're different, but you laugh at them because they're all the same. This is something that got me through. And then I did a lot of, you know, very unique things. Um, I never kind of saw age as anything to... Uh, stop me. Um, when I was uh, 18, I organized my first conference through all my lunch breaks at the Leaving Cert. I started my first nonprofit with Bill Yao and started uh, my first company. And this is just a small bit of the things that I've learned as a young entrepreneur. So firstly, I don't believe in age. And I kind of expanded this a bit more later on. But age is becoming more and more or less relevant. Um, the things I do believe in is like things like ability, experience, potential, attitude, and talent. So what I'm going to do first is I'm just going to introduce myself. Uh, my name is James Welton. I'm 19 and I finished my leaving cert in June. Hooray. And I'm from Cork in Ireland. And I'm an entrepreneur. I have disruptive dev. And we're closing our seed round at the moment. And I'll expand on all the mistakes and failures I've done on that later on. And I'm a charity guy with Coder Dojo. And my favorite breakdancing move is the worm. And I've learned to be very careful in including that in talks because I had 200 secondary school pupils peer pressure me into doing it recently on stage. So, Coder Dojo is this network of free computer clubs for kids that is now expanding across the globe. We run them every Saturday. We've got kids coming from all around. When we started in Cork, we had kids traveling two hours to come on the bus. We are five months old, 110% free. Kids who come from disadvantaged areas, we give spare machines and laptops. We have about 120 kids aged between the ages of seven and 19, 35 volunteers and mentors every Saturday, and massive waiting lists. And we're currently in Cork, Limerick, Dublin, and Kerry. We're opening our first one in London on the 3rd of December, first one in Paris on the 7th of December. I'm traveling over to the States in December, um, thanks to Polaris Ventures, and they're giving me a hand setting up a few there in San Francisco and, and uh, in New York. We do a lot of web technologies. We do teach them how to mock up applications, play with computer hardware game development, and we get in some speakers to talk what it's like to be in the computer industry. We've had a lot of really positive feedback from it, and we have people who've made like they've become best friends uh, as a result. Um, and it was started because the state of IT in education for young people in Ireland really sucked. Like I was started developing uh, websites and doing animations when I was nine, but you know I get really frustrated and pull out my hair at uh, small issues, and there was nobody there to help me out. Um, 
And it's really important. You know, it's an environment to nurture interest and talent. Uh, some kids, don't, they don't have any sports, they don't have any other activities. We find some really incredible young people who come to it. It's a framework for help and support if there's issues. We people like, meet like-minded people and we raise um, the next generation of le uh, young developers. And that's a very esoteric programming joke to do with databases, um, which some of you may not get. <laughs> um, and some of the things we've learned in the process is instant gratification, like when you do a line of code, execute it, and see. Uh, context when teaching, when kids see that they're using the same type of image tags in the same way that Facebook do it, they're, you know, they love it. Uh, trying to explain variables to an eight-year-old is a very interesting thing. But you explain, you know, you contextualize it, you explain them like lunch boxes that hold information in them. And you help kids teaching each other, um, you have kids teaching each other. We've had like, uh, 12-year-old teacher, 15-year-old had to do a WordPress install. And like this was me when I like, got my first recognition for programming. And I like to think that I've changed a bit since then, uh, hopefully. Um, but you know, this was, this was at a time when there was like, very, very little out there. Um, but anyway, back to why I don't believe in age. Uh, age is becoming less relevant. And there's a few people that you know, are testimony to us. So this is Harry Morin. He's 12 years old. He's officially the youngest Mac developer. His first game he released Pizza Bot last week beat Angry Birds in the Irish Mac App Store. It went to number one in top paid. The second screenshot is actually an older one. It's, it was actually at number two in top paid overall. We taught him the foundations on how to make games, Cutter Dojo, and he's been working since and put in a lot of difficult work. And then there's Shane. So when we first started Coder Dojo, and uh, there's a reason why I haven't given his full name. So when we first started Coder Dojo in Cork, I had this uh, guy email me say, well, hey James, you know, love what you're doing. When you come to Dublin, please you know, give me a, you know, call me up. I'd love to help out in a more administration role. Um, I've been, I did my first Linux install when I was age six. You know, I've been doing a lot of web development recently. Anyway, I'd love to get involved. Uh, you're Shane, aged 11. So I'm 19 and I was like, whoa, I'm way past my best before date. Even at the age of 11, when he was 10, he ran an illegal web hosting company. So he's a pretty entrepreneurial and interesting guy. <laughs> and then there's people like Daniel Bravosky. He just turned 19 and he already runs a tech incubation space for teenagers. And he's worked with TechCrunch companies he's been a founding member of have been acquired. And you know, he's just a, a really, uh, He's a really great guy, and another reason of, you know, he's doing more with his life than people in their 40s have. So yes, age is becoming less relevant. Albeit that it's very difficult for people to take young people serious at times. Uh, I was issued with an 11-year passport when I was about 10, and when I failed to have my company registered, this was what was submitted to the CRO. <laughs> So yeah, you know, with all the good things that happens with young people, that, that doesn't mean we make mistakes. Um, but sometimes it's how we deal with the mistakes rather than how we make them that defines us. One incident that stands out to me is the bus meltdown. I started Disrupt Developments in June, and we started off with a micro seed round and a grant from Enterprise Ireland. Now grants are lovely things, they're free money, but there's often a lot of heartbreak that comes with them. And we were claiming back, and we were, I thought that it would be claimed back on a Friday. And it was a relatively large amount, so it would keep us going for another period. But they rang me up and told me that it would actually take uh, two, uh, two weeks longer than I'd expected. So then I realized that as I got on that bus back to, uh, back to Cork, that I had to run a company with three people and overheads for two weeks with zero euros. Um, so suffice to say, I had, a, I had a bit of a meltdown on the bus and really freaked out the person who was sitting next to me. I couldn't contain myself. Um, but it was, you know, once I kind of picked myself back up, I, for the next few weeks I hustled. I was very frugal. I ate more cat food than I would regularly. And I worked a lot of uh, the time part-time as a developer so I could get the company through those two weeks. And then we got our uh, claim back. Um, so, and then I learned to be really kick-ass at cash flow forecasting. So we shouldn't be afraid to make mistakes. But if we do, we should learn from them. This is what we've got now. We've got social force. I spent from June until mid-August developing something, which at the end of it, due to a few mistakes on my part, I didn't like. I didn't like where it was. And the market fit wasn't right, so we pivoted. And some people would say that's a waste of three months and me missing my leaving cert holidays and a lot of nights out with my friends. But we found out where our market fit was, and now we're closing a seed round next week. So you know, whatever mistake you have, um, whatever anyone says, getting over that and moving forward um, is the best thing. And being independent as well. Um, because when you're independent, it's all your effort. It's just you who's driving something forward. I've had people promise me the moon and the stars and they haven't come through. Um, but I've also had people who've been really helpful to me and assisted me. But so long as it's you who's the driving force, it's you who will define the direction that it goes. And do it while you can. I, can, I can't say this from a retrospective, uh, stance, but I can say this from a predictive stance. Um, you know, before you've got any ties, before you've got any kids that you know of, or any um, mortgages or anything, go for it and just do it.
So I'd like to thank you now for listening and implore you to check out Coder Dojo and help out young people in your area who are interested in the topic. So thank you very much.